some of the movies that uh, he made at Monogram Pictures, uh, which was a very low budget uh, operation uh, uh, in the 1940s. Uh, uh, it eventually evolved, uh, ironically enough, into uh, uh, allied artists, uh, Monogram being dissolved in the very early 50s, and the name Allied Artists, which in the late 40s was an attempt by Monogram to maybe uh, get away from its reputation for being uh, kind of a, a low budget B uh, production affair. Uh, Carlson did do a couple of films that uh, uh, monogram that I, I thought warranted. In fact, Black Gold is, now that I'm thinking about it, is probably the first movie that was released as an Allied artist film in 1947. Anthony Quinn and uh, Cecil B. DeMille's daughter uh, were the stars of it, and uh, it was a, a, a decent little uh, uh, film. Uh, some of the other things that Carlson went on to do at Columbia Pictures uh, merited some note. Uh, I always liked the movie called Adventures of S in Silverado, which is based on a, on a Robert Louis Stevenson story of all uh, authors to consider a, a, a story that took place in the western part of uh, this country. Uh, Scandal Sheet uh, was about the newspaper business. Uh, Broderick Crawford was a star of that. It took Kansas City Confidential and 99 River Street, which both starred John Payne, to uh, uh, give uh, Carlson some reputation as a filmmaker of some uh, uh, caliber. Uh, and this followed a couple of years later. Uh, tight Spot, uh, Five Against the House, uh, both made in 1955 also, uh, would warrant uh, viewing, I think, still. Uh, Brian Keith uh, uh, being in uh, uh, both of those movies, uh, co-starring with Ginger Rogers and Edward G. Robinson in Tight Spot and, and Guy Madison in uh, Five Against the House. Uh, you know, Jimmy's brother, who's a film buff of some note and a, and a writer, uh, said that one of his favorite movies is uh, Gunman's Walk, which I haven't seen, but it made me want to go see it. Just uh, to kind of, he, he called it a superb, unjustly forgotten gem. Yeah. So, but that's almost like that's the director's, you know, it, it, he didn't really do that much that rose to the level of, uh, you know, cultural phenomenon, except rather later, late, later on in his career when he did Walking. His one Hollywood success, I guess. Uh, it was a huge success yeah. for Carlson. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it, it probably set him up so that he could retire because he doesn't make that many movies afterwards. Hmm. Uh, it, it was an incredible commercial success uh, in uh, 1973. Uh, the one that I thought well of, uh, uh, Gunman's Walk, was Van Heflin and uh, I think Tab Hunter uh, was uh, one of the co-stars. Uh, in that film. Uh, 
1960, a movie called Hell to Eternity with Jeffrey Hunter, a really superb World War II movie that took place in the Pacific. Uh, and it was one of the first movies, I think, that dealt with uh, what happened to Japanese people during the Second World War, hmm. that they were indeed uh, 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 gathered and put into uh, areas uh, where they could be watched. And uh, the character that Jeffrey Hunter played in Hell to Eternity uh, hmm. had been adopted uh, by a Japanese family and was really a very important soldier for the Allies because he knew how to speak Japanese. And uh, he, he indeed went to uh, the uh, uh, Pacific uh, during the Second World War and it is an account of how uh, 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 good a soldier he was and also that there, there were aspects of his uh, uh, upbringing that were very prominent in the, uh, the capture of a great deal of Japanese in this one particular battle that Hell to Eternity uh, represents. It's funny, there's, a, there's a, a smattering of social conscience all throughout this film, also apart from the, you know, the standing up against corruption and, and, uh, and, and murder in a, in a small town, but of course there's a lot of, of sort of the you know the uh, the civil rights component to it. The um, the character is he with his his uh, his ex, you know his understanding of what it's like to have somebody take the law into their own hands, and uh, and then it, the the movie is set right at the um, as the GIs were returning from the Korean War, which was not a war that got a lot of cinematic treatment the way that World War Two or even Vietnam did, uh, but it was um, that there was probably a lot of that that sense of these returning. Yeah, just as we have returning GIs now who come back with problems or you know they've seen it all, done it all. So there was probably a lot of that mood in the country of the, the return of these of these people and what were they coming home to. So yeah. in this particular case it was nothing very pleasant uh, in as right. far as uh, the Kylie character was concerned. Right. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, that I enjoyed for the second watching of this was I was looking at the craft that uh, he displayed in putting the film together, and sometimes it's a little, it was a little clunkier. We're so used to the sophistications now of uh, you know film acting and directing um, and effects, but um, but I, I was realizing how how neatly he conceived a lot of these scenes. And and you were pointing out that he didn't really start as a director. He started very early in the uh, in the film business. He kind of was groomed by the film business. Yeah, I, I read that he was. I don't even know what this is, but he was a gag man for Buster Keaton. He was a props man. He was, uh, what is a gag man? <laughs> I, I don't know. I would imagine with Keaton that would be a dangerous job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I didn't know that about the yeah. Carlson. So, so he, yeah, he was a, you know, a product of the movies in a way. And, and so he had a lot of skills when he, kept, when he got around to making this and some of his later films. And one of the things that I, I appreciated learning about him was that he'd made a couple of the Matt Helm films which, if you all remember, after you know when, when the James Bond movies were taking hold and we had to have our own kind of boozy American James Bond, we got Matt Helms uh, when he was played. Have you ever seen those movies? I, I, well, I saw them a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 Pieces of 93 work. over on Loud Road, I think I played most of those movies. <laughs> uh, in, in retrospect, uh, the, they're pretty lousy, I think. <laughs> but, but that was, that was I, I, his... I don't remember them well. <laughs> to mimic uh, the James Bond films. Uh, uh, I, I'd give James Coburn a couple of uh, 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 shots as uh, uh, like Flint, Flint. Flint. Uh, yeah. our man Flint, and yeah. like Flint before I would say too much about Pat Hell. Maybe I'm being too cruel, but uh, uh, yeah. I didn't remember them favorably. We were just uh, we were absorbing anything that they would throw at us cinematically back then. So. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Those were big hits. Uh, yeah. I, I, I was not unhappy to play them in Cinema 93, but as far as uh, historically, if you're looking back for uh, 
something that emulated uh, the Bond movies well, uh, uh, don't go there. <laughs> Please. Uh, but, uh, but Phil Carlson, and again, the, what this series is about is, and, and that's why you were given this sheet to begin with, uh, it, it, if you did like this and you are uh, uh, listening to what Rick and I have to say about uh, some of the other things that Carlson did, uh, maybe if you ever saw them playing or you could indeed seek them out uh, uh, by virtue of some pay-per-view systems that indeed, uh, I, I know the, the one title there, Kansas City Confidential, is a, is a uh, public domain title. You could probably see that uh, uh, on all sorts of uh, 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 programs that uh, could be showing uh, uh, film uh, specifically. Yeah, um, I, I love the, the, the subtitle for that movie. It was The Picture That Hits with Bullet Force and Blackjack Fury. There was a lot of bullets and blackjacks in this movie, too. Yeah. Um, and, and Carlson was also uh, a very prominent as far as television is concerned, which uh, the three, uh, or in fact, the four, uh, yeah, no, the three male actors here that are prominent, John McIntyre, Richard Kiley, and Edward Andrews, who played the... Uh, the, the, the bad element, the red tanner, uh, they have incredible uh, amounts of TV uh, product that they were involved with. Uh, I mean, it, it, there's, there's literally hundreds of acting credits, and a lot of it is television. Yes? Yeah, um, that's, I just wanted to ask you about uh, the actor that played Tanner, because I, you know, recognized him from must have been TV, but a lot of things. I didn't oh, know. Was if you knew anything that was big offhand, because it was driving me crazy somewhere, I'm like, God, I know his face, I know I've seen him in stuff, but I couldn't uh, place anything. One of the last things he ever did is noted in his uh, IMDb uh, bio, and that's 16 Candles. Oh, he played oh, the God. grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, he, yeah. and he's also prominent in a movie called Elmer Gantry. Uh, okay. in 1960, about five years after this was made, which is kind of surprising uh, uh, because uh, one of the first things that I read about Edward Andrews was that he was the son of a Georgia minister. Uh, so, uh, you know, ending up being, more often than not, uh, a man of d d d dubious uh, virtue in quite a few films. Uh, uh, but he started off as a stage actor, and he has 180 acting credits on the IMDb in a short 35-year career, which started at, uh, in his mid-30s as far as film is concerned and TV. Uh, so he, he, was, he was a busy guy. Uh, McIntyre, uh, who played Albert Patterson, <coughs> he's also been in, in a lot of television. Probably most prominent was uh, uh, Wagon Train. Uh, he uh, replaced Lord Bond when uh, Bond uh, uh, died uh, rather suddenly. Uh, uh, and the one that I always remember uh, John McIntyre from, and maybe you won't recall him being in the film, but I remember him being in, in Psycho. He plays uh, the sheriff in the community where the Bates Motel was uh, located. He's kind of a laid-back guy who probably figures that uh, Norman Bates was a uh, uh, you know, a, a dear soul and trying to get out of living and, and by gum the, the road had bypassed the motel and there, there was just not much activity there until Janet Lee came along. Uh, then there was a little spate of activity which uh, uh, got uh, Anthony Perkins and uh, his mother into a lot of trouble. But you know, speaking to, to the, once again, to the craftsmanship of, the, of, of Carlson in this, did, uh, you may have picked up on the same fact, but um, but uh, John McIntyre is actually wearing the clothes that um, Albert Patterson, they were his actual clothes. His I, thought, I thought that was kind of creepy. Wow. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, I'm sure it's not the clothes he was shot in. They're probably, but we, his wife. No, they were, it was his, his they used his right. clothes. His wife his was, wardrobe, was one of the interviewees side. in the beginning, so I imagine two years later she'd still have some of his clothes. Yeah, I, that, I mean, that's the other thing that I thought was strange. Uh, in, I, I don't like the prologue. I, I, I think the prologue is, uh, it's almost like amateur. Uh, uh, but it does show uh, Mrs. Patterson. 
And I don't believe she's seen in the movie. No, no, no. no signs of her whatsoever. No, you see the daughter-in-law right. no. and the son, but you never see the mother. And you, the and you hear the family. daughter, you hear the daughter-in-law say, "Mom stayed with your with your dad," you know. And at one point, when when he's trying to make her, or she's trying to go to the mothers or whatever it is, or grandmothers. Um, and she, who was Ma Beach? Exactly. She's, I think she's a famous character from town. I think she's the, the lady herself, that stopped on the street. So. Isn't she the one stopped on the street? Yeah. She, yeah. Yeah. That yeah. really she awkward interview there. That, that character from, from the town. Right, I, but how did she earn this role? Because she just gets a little bit of sort of dialogue, doesn't advance anything. She's no. just a little street encounter. Yeah, I just think, you know. But she must have earned her way. Like, she uh, won a contest. Because I just wanted to ask you, is, is this, and there was it was very obvious that uh, I was watching the crowd and um, a lot of the people in the crowd were flashing the camera. Yeah. And um, so did they actually take it in Phoenix City? Yeah. Yes. Uh, this was actually filmed now. And it's just, okay. just a couple and, of years and, after and this used, and, and used the townspeople, yeah. I'm assuming. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And, and, okay. I, I think as uh, Kylie uh, intones at the end of it, uh, there was still legal yeah. proceedings going oh, yeah. on oh, when yeah. uh, this was made. Yeah. Which is why they did put that, that piece at the beginning, because it was in the news and it was something that they, they wanted to position the movie as part of the story. Yeah, you know, because he's even story. saying something about, um, and, and John is uh, now defending uh, mm -hmm. or, or trying to locate uh, 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 the people that knew his father. And Richard Kiley, of course, was a man of La Mancha, which yes. is something yeah. we no, the, forget yeah. about. He, he, he was noted for his stage performances. Yeah. And he, he won a couple of Tonys, uh, uh, one for his dual role in uh, Man of La Mancha, which, if I read that correctly, that was reprised uh, several times yes. uh, after he had had, I think, a six-year run mm -hmm. on Broadway with it, yeah. uh, which... which uh, Accounts for probably some lapses in the in the film and television uh, biography that uh, you would read about him. Uh, a couple of the other movies that I, I remember Kylie from uh, from the fifties. Uh, a couple of years before this, he plays a very prominent part, and he's a bad guy <coughs> in uh, Pick Up on South Street, Sam Fuller's movie about uh, uh, espionage in this in this country, and. Uh, He's also got a, a very delicate role in Blackboard Jungle. Huh. He plays uh, a, a teacher uh, that is part of the school system that Glenn Ford uh, is arriving uh, into in uh, the, the roughest part of New York City. And uh, he gets his record collection destroyed by the, the hoodlum aspect in the school because he brings that to try to present to the kids, uh, what he feels is a little bit of, uh, 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 well, uh, music that they m should be paying attention to more than uh, Bill Haley's uh, uh, Rock Around the Clock, which was uh, Blackboard Jungle had, had no other claim to fame. It was the first movie to use uh, rock and roll music uh, during the course of its uh, 105 minutes. Uh, but uh, uh, Kylie uh, is, uh, uh, he, uh, he also appeared in uh, uh, Broadway plays called No Strings and Redhead, which he uh, uh, had a lot of, but he had a, a beautiful singing voice, a baritone. Uh, uh, and and the, uh, the lady that sticks out here is uh, Catherine Grant. Uh, she plays uh, Ellie Rhodes and at the time, uh, Grant was uh, a contract player at Columbia Pictures, apparently loaned out uh, to be in this film. And uh, like it or not, her claim to fame uh, is probably the fact that she became Mrs. Bing Crosby uh, about <laughs> two years after this was made. And uh, she didn't go into full retirement, but uh, it, the uh, movie and TV work was uh, it definitely put off uh, on the back burner so she could, I think she ended up having three children with uh, Ben Crosby. Uh, a couple of the things that I remember Catherine Grant and aside from this is uh, 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 Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, the Ray, Ray Harryhausen uh, 
uh, stop motion animation adventure, and uh, a, a movie which probably would rival this for uh, being more adult uh, than uh, most movies were at the time. The 1960 uh, movie uh, Anatomy of a Murder, uh, Catherine yeah, Grant was in that. Uh, and th that was, uh, uh, I think, ahead of its time as far as presenting uh, some touchy aspects of uh, what you might find in, in court. Uh, and fabulous, and I'm not to digress too much on that title, but a, a guy by the name of Joseph Welch uh, was in that movie. And Joseph Welch uh, had had a hand in the uh, uh, McCarthy hearings uh, earlier in the decade. And he made a dynamite judge uh, in, that, in that movie, uh, uh, a role which uh, I don't think he really had to act too much uh, in, in order to uh, conceive, because uh, he was a judge. Uh, we need to get the terrific poster. <laughs> oh, I had that for a while. Yeah. Uh, and it was in pretty good shape. Because uh, that's an original from 1955. And they, they, they definitely were not soft pedaling the uh, yeah. uh, Meg Miles uh, <laughs> portion of the movie uh, with the advertising, even though she gets uh, credit on the, on the posters being in the movie, but she sings one song and yeah. is in uh, uh, the, the, the moment when they're uh, rejoicing because they think they've won as far as the election is concerned. But uh, uh, I, I, best of my knowledge, that was Meg Miles' claim to cinematic fame. <laughs> Yeah. How many noir films are based on Pulitzer Prize winning uh, newspaper stories, too? So, the, uh, I mean, that, the, the newspaper and the, and the magazine connections are, are in all of the advertising and all the look, you know, yeah, uh, like Life the magazine, yeah. ripped yeah. from the pages. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I bet that, may, that might be the Columbus Ledger's only Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, well, and the movie starts out just as soon as it jumps from uh, the prologue. What are you seeing? You're seeing uh, articles from magazines uh, right. over the, the title of the film. Uh, and another odd aspect of this movie, which didn't happen too often, no cast is mentioned at the beginning of the film. Mm -hmm. None. Mm -hmm. No actor is mentioned. It, it's just the, uh, the yeah, yeah it, it takes the end of the film and it, with the recast for you to realize uh, who these actors were, uh, mm -hmm. which I suspect was another attempt uh, at uh, uh, making you think that you were watching uh, uh, an almost documentary uh, approach to filmmaking here. Yes? Oh, I was just wondering if you've ever seen... Um, I've seen all of those movies. Yeah, okay, because I'm curious, because I love Frederick March, and I'm, I'm just wondering about this Young Doctors. Not much of a movie, really. Not much. Uh, it had a, a really good cast. Uh, uh, and I believe it was one of the first movies that Dick Clark was in. I think Dick Clark was in that film, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, the uh, uh, Frederick March and uh, who the heck else? Uh, uh, it was a good cast, and I, I, I probably shouldn't have said it was a bad movie. Yeah, but it was not a great movie. Yeah, Let me yeah. put it that way. Uh, and, uh, but he, he, uh, Carlson, so completely lived in that bandwidth of the B-movie that was his, you know, uh, so th there was a lot of depth and there was a lot of lows to yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to that and, and uh, in the, the cases that are written here, uh, it was B+. Plus. Yeah, the B+. The B plus. <laughs> plus, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, got a, I got a great quote from um, the Criminal Element website, and, and this, uh, this is a promising, you know, sort of uh, intro to a director I'd never heard of, had never heard the name before, but uh, they, they said there's some pretty stiff co uh, competition for the toughest director in film war. In the 40s and 50s, the directors of B-level crime pictures seemed to be locked in a contest to see who could inject the most head-thumping into an 80-minute pot boiler. Any list of war's toughest directors would have to include such pugilistic auteurs as Anthony Mann, Robert Aldrich, Richard Fleischer, and Sam Fuller. That said, the toughest war director of them all might well have been Phil Carlson. So, I, who knew? Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. Okay. Well, it makes me want to watch Walking Tall again. Yeah. yeah well, interesting, just, an just interesting the, I mean, parallel to this. Yes, because I, I was thinking that, and I mean, I, I saw Walking Tall back in, like, 1973. Yeah.
entertainment. Oh, and I have never seen it since, but uh, you know, I do remember it's that kind of vigilante. Mm -hmm. Well, they, yeah, well, they, they kind of well, made it beat the character uh, of the character to death, which is probably not a good uh, <laughs> thing. They give it Richard Kiley a four foot long hickory stick. You could have just dealt with the whole problem. Right, yeah. you know? But I'd like to see that. But that, now, that, there was a couple of sequels to Walking Tall, which uh, uh, kind of uh, maybe diminished the, the impact of the need, need this hall. Okay. We're just having too much fun again.